Foot Clan, before we start today's show, I want to remind you about the best UDK ever. New and improved features in this year's Ultimate Draft Kit. You do not want to miss them. You can access them right now by going to ultimatedraftkit.com. And once again, you get the entire suite of tools, expert picks, research tools, projected stats, player profiles, player profile videos, everything you need to dominate your upcoming draft. And you also get it on mobile as a part of the Ultimate Draft Kit. Head over there right now, ultimatedraftkit.com. To the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Back with you, Jason Moore, Mike the Fantasy Hitman Wright. I'm Andy Holloway. We are the Fantasy Footballers. Back with you for Tuesday, July 14th. AFC East breakdown episode. The days keep... They keep going by. (laughs) The days keep (laughs) daying. We were... uh, If you notice, if you watch us on YouTube, I mean, if you you don't, you don't know. Shame on you. But if you watch us on YouTube... And that's the way you consume this show. You'll notice there's a variety of bouncing around. Sometimes all three of us are in the studio. Sometimes it's been two of us and one person at home. And uh, today, we we thought we'd have two in the studio, one at home, and then it became three at home. And that's just what life's like in Arizona right now. Mm-hmm. That and, this, and hot. It is it's so extremely hot. hot. It, I, I can't touch my car handle. Or the door handle at all. Uh, over the weekend, I was in the pool and I was sweating in the pool. Oh, like that's how hot. Which it really was. happens. The water yes. is too hot to get in right now. It's like someone bring me some ice. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 crazy. So, uh, but out here in Arizona, we are we are being as uh, responsible with our company as possible in terms of uh, just keeping everybody safe. So if you know, basically if. If Mike's dog's friend's uncle has a sniffle, we're mm-hmm. keeping it remote on those days because we have the luxury to do that. We're thankful for that. And keep uh, it 100, man. Yeah, and well, speak, we want to keep, Bro- keep Brooks safe, really. Speaking of you, yeah, Brooks is, is His very immu- fragile. Uh, yeah, immune very system's fragile. probably <laughs> just the worst. Uh, Brooks is the one who eats an apple every day, though. So he's, yeah, That's true. He's probably fine. Uh, but speaking of YouTube... We're on the march, man. I don't know if you guys realize we are on the march to two hundred thousand subs. Oh, so okay. let's get there tomorrow. Yeah, that just, would just saying. That's we're close. That's yeah. awesome. That's great. You can go to uh, youtubecom slash football or subscribe. Click the bell. Yeah, and um, become one of those people with the bragging rights of saying, "Oh, I was one of the first two hundred thousand subs," which is like <laughs> huge bragging right. I mean, that is a big deal. <laughs> Tell your children about it. Tell your kids. Twitter at the FF Ballers. Mike is at FF Hitman. Jason is at Jason FFL. I'm at Andy Holloway. And uh, I did post a picture of the car thermometer showing a sweet 116 here in Arizona yesterday. Nice. Uh, so you know that it's real. All right. Quick question of the day on today's show. This one comes in from Steven in New Jersey. He says he won the loser's bracket of teams that didn't make the playoffs. So he gets to choose his draft position as a consolation prize. What spot should I pick from and what factors should I consider when selecting my draft spot? Okay, okay. I mean, there is no right answer. You can win from anywhere out there. I would say if I was But what's the right answer? Well, (laughs) if if I'm picking the spot, it's going to be one or two. I want Christian McCaffrey or or Saquon. I, I want one of these studs. Interesting. Um, so Zeke is it's a big two for you this year. It yeah, is for I, me too. My favorite spot's the number two. Yeah, I, I want right. I want one of those two. I would probably pick the number one pick. Just get McCaffrey, get it out of the way, deal with the fact that my second round is a little weaker because he's so much better if he retains that same workhorse workhorse role. But let's say you're in one of those leagues where, you know, you 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 do get an order to who picks, but those top spots are gone. 
that's where this year I like the 11 spot. Um, I like the 11 because one, it's very strategic to be one spot off of the turn. You can play the look at one other team, you know, halfway yeah, through the roster. draft. Look at their roster and say they need to go this position. So I'm going to go that position first. Then they're going to take two of those. I'll get the other guy I want. Love being one spot away from the turn, which, Andy, as you said, you like the number two spot. That would be the same thing. And the other reason is because this year I'm all in on Kenyon Drake. I think he is a top back. He will be there at the 11 spot. I'm I'm right now I'm in an industry mock draft with a bunch of uh, Jake Seeley and Liz Loza, Brad Evans, a bunch bunch of people, great people, and um. I'm at the 11, and I started with Dalvin Cook, who fell there, um, and turned it around with Josh Jacobs. So, uh, you know, to me, if you can start with two stud running backs at the end of the first, I'm just as happy with that as I would be getting, you know, one of those top two guys. Mike, I, I, I'm um, Zeke is still in the the top tier for me, so I'm I'm fine with the top three pick. But be, if you have your choice, you and you really favor one of those running backs, then just take the first pick. It really, but to your point, if you think there are three guys in that category, then go with the lowest. If you think there's five guys in that category, go with the lowest so that you can turn around in the second round with the best odds of getting a high value player. I got a DM, somebody asking us, you know, you know, why why project a player like Michael Thomas at number one at the wide receiver position when historically Players that finish number one at any of the positions don't generally repeat the finish. Sure. And so uh, I thought that was an interesting question to bring up too in the context of maybe this McCaffrey-Saquon or McCaffrey-Saquon-Zeke choice. The reason players are projected that way is not because you're guaranteed to have that player repeat. It's all based on uh, probability of a player putting up a great season. So even if Michael Thomas is unlikely to be the number one, he is still the most likely uh, in terms of who you could select to end up there. Does that make sense? Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. It's I mean, you had volume for me. Like Michael Thomas' volume is going to repeat. Christian McCaffrey does have the red flag of he's got, you know, new people calling the shots, but he is. most likely to repeat at the position. Yeah, right. I mean, the nice and, thing for McCaffrey is Reggie Bonifant because that's sure. who's sharing the work. There's just nobody Super else. Bonifant. Yeah, there's, there's nobody else to share the load with. So Andy, did you get like, that reference? That was a Super Bon Bon reference? That was a Super yeah. Bon Bon reference. Super Bon Bon, Super Bon Bon. Oh, man, I I thought that one was just for the people. I'm I enjoyed proud it. of you, man. I enjoyed it. It was subtle, but uh, 90s alternative, so I mm -hmm. appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the thing is, is if you put those players, you know, if you charted all the, let's say you top the top players out, Maybe Michael Thomas has a 30% chance to repeat. Maybe you think that Julio Jones has a 25% chance to be the number one receiver. That's how I think of it mentally, is each of these players has a percentage chance of being the top guy. Some of them have a higher chance of being a guaranteed top five player. And that's kind of you know how you look at it. If you want to take the shot, that's why I like being at number two. I think Saquon, because of who he is, the talent, the ability, what he did at the back half of the year after the injury, and you combine that with what McCaffrey, like you brought up, different offense, some variables, different quarterback. I put them very similar in terms of their odds of sure. finishing at number one. So I choose to go number two there and be a pick earlier or later. But that's kind of the thought process behind those. I want to encourage everybody to check out footclanvote.com. You can nominate the podcast for the podcast awards. Mm. Uh, we are nominated in the people's choice and the sports category. That's what you can nominate us for. And then uh, you can slide over to the comedy section if you're bored, like while you're doing it, and just throw the spitballers in there yeah, too. Come on! And, and, and while you're at it, make sure you click the little box that says "Yes, I would like to vote." Yeah, they email uh, it, as long as you check that box, they'll email a random amount of people to be a final voter on the podcast awards, which are always very fun. In the Foot Clan, you have a reputation to uphold here, so it's true. No pressure, but uh, you know. <laughs> A symbol. That's yeah. all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Anything in the news there, Judge Giamatti? Anything for us to discuss? The NFL's uh, released a picture of a new helmet. Is that news? It is now. It is now that you brought it up. I like... Uh, it's an interesting time because training camp, we don't know if it's going to start on time. Every day there's a, a piece of news, positive or negative, 
in in the endeavor for the NFL and the NFLPA to get a 2020 season together, uh, you know, this falls in the cool. They're doing more things to try to help the players category. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. Uh, three teams are have expressed interest in free agent Jordan Reed. Ooh, incredible! We should have <laughs> we could have taken him with our last pick in the uh, in the Scotty Fishbowl, but I got my guy Rodney Anderson. What's the true. Remember Jermichael Finley? Oh, yeah. yeah. Remember when there was some interest at the end of his career and we're all kind of just saying, listen. Yeah, but I think his situation was different. Like, didn't he have a full-on insurance policy on himself where if he didn't go back to football, that he got this huge payday? So, I mean, it was one, he didn't have to risk his body by, by going back. And two, he still made the monies. So... Jordan Reed's career earnings are twenty five point zero two million dollars. Um, it's not bad. That's not bad. Stay safe, my friend. <laughs> yes, <laughs> stay safe. It, he's such a great talent that yes, you would it, love it, to see that resurgence if possible. I just Reed. It's tough. Reed's injuries are they suck so bad, man. What he could have been. Yeah. Yeah. All right. If we don't want to talk about any other, uh, if there's no other news to talk about, let's uh, get divisional. Let's get divisional. All right, we're in the AFC East. If you wanted to apprise yourself of the previous, what is it, two episodes? That's when we began the divisional breakdowns. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we, we are releasing shows three times a week right now, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. So we released a Saturday episode this past week you can check out as well. Might I just recommend you do check them out because they are excellent. <laughs> um, not, it's one of those things where I, I love going through this process because all three of us, we do our own research, we prep for these shows, then we come in, we're all laying out our beliefs, and a lot of times hearing all three of our opinions changes my own rankings. I've got my rankings pulled up, you know, I'm uh, you know going through, and it, it's just really valuable to have the big snapshot of a team at yeah. a time. It, it's really the only time of the year that we take a holistic look at one team, and so you want to get all the divisional breakdowns for sure. So if you missed the last two, congratulations, you have more footballers. Two, uh, today's AFC East, we're doing AFC West on Thursday, then we're coming back with a mock draft episode on Saturday, and then we'll go back through divisions after that. The New England Patriots, 12-4, and four, they're the team we'll start this discussion around. No more Tom Brady, that's been the headline of the entire offseason. Last year, they were 18th in the NFL in rushing yards per game. Passing yards per game, they were up at number eight. Um, this was not the same old Patriots offense. We know that their defense played such a huge role last year in what they were able to accomplish at 12 and four. Uh, they ranked 23rd in yards per offensive play. And uh, that went down from week seven through 17. So they were even less productive over the back half of the year, just 4.9 yards per offensive play 25th in football. That is the fewest yards per play since 2006 for a Patriots team, which I thought was very interesting when you look holistically at this team and what you would expect them to be able to do this year. There's a lot of kind of like high-level perception that, well, Tom Brady's gone. This team can only exist in the framework of a great defense and kind of figuring out the offense bit by bit. But now Cam Newton's been signed, and they weren't that great on offense last year despite going 12-4. and four. Mike, I know that you believe in Belichick more than yes. uh, just about anybody. So is it a rosier view at this point when you when you see that the offense wasn't great last year? They were still 12-4. and four. You've got Cam Newton coming in now. It, what's yeah, your what's, thought? What, my thoughts are it's, it's really interesting because this won't be the first time that Bill Belichick has – shuffled up his entire offense and this these are offenses that had Tom Brady like he went he's been run heavy he's been tight end heavy he's been he's had two tight end sets he's had elite wide receiver numbers with like Randy Moss I mean, the slot receiver is kind of a uh it's a common factor like that he always has that but other than that like he, Bill Belichick changes things all the time he tries to stay one one to two steps ahead of what the NFL is doing to catch up when his offenses become prolific. So I'm very excited to see what he can do 
with with Cam Newton, I'm projecting Cam Newton as a starter, but I'd also say I still believed in this team when we thought it was going to be Jarrett Stidham. I think that Bill will figure it out, and there'll be guys with fantasy value on this team still. One of the things that's interesting is you you brought up their tight end. You know, they had the Rob Gronkowski, Aaron Hernandez era of Patriots offensive football. And then you look to last year where they were literally dead last in the National Football League in terms of targets right. to the tight end position. They didn't People have one, keep, so they don't throw to them. Right. And that's good coaching rather than yes. conforming targets to positions and players that don't have the ability to produce. We keep trying to, as the fantasy community at large, year after year, fit uh, you know, our expectations onto Bill Belichick as opposed to the other way around at times. Um and then you end up with that situation where they're not targeting the tight end. And yeah, you sure, you pick the right Patriots tight end and they're dead last in the league in targets. Uh, Jason, what, what are your thoughts on this offense as a whole when it comes to fantasy and potential uh, opportunities that maybe the fantasy community isn't seeing? Yeah, I, I think everything changed when they got Cam Newton. Um, this offense was one I didn't want any part of. Um, and I changed a little bit when they brought in Cam Newton, specifically the running game, I think things are going to open up for Sony Michelle a lot. Um, you know, last year he was not good. Uh, I don't know that he's really ever been good. I wasn't a huge fan of him coming out of college. Can I, can I shoot a stat at you, Jay, to highlight that? Yes, I've got my bulletproof vest on. <laughs> Sony Michelle has stat five. He has five running back one scoring weeks in twenty nine regular season games. Yes, with not 18 good. weeks as an RB3 or lower. Yes. And, and maybe doesn't is, get the goal line now with Cam Newton. Five times? Five yeah, times. It, yeah, which, you know, According to, to some degree football. has been good news when, when, you, when you didn't believe in the player. But I, I also think that, you know, when, when Tom Brady's there, obviously Tom Brady's the GOAT. He's great. But when they didn't do what you would expect them to do of of like masking when they're going to run you know they they just bring in and say we're we're running the ball in a heavy set and i think that sony isn't good enough to get it done but here's the thing that changes when cam newton is on the field against the stacked boxes uh this is according to warren sharp uh, cam newton and the panthers against stacked boxes running backs were able to have a great yards per carry, a great positive result. And as soon as Cam left, they didn't. And that's the same running back. So you have to, it's very similar to what you see in Baltimore. If you have a true mobile quarterback, and I think Bill Belichick is going to run Cam Newton like crazy. It's a one-year contract. He's going to see if he can create a great offense around Cam Newton's strengths. And I think that will open up running r rushing lanes for Sony Michelle. So the goal line, uh, might be vultured a little bit, but I do think if Sony does not land on the pup, he's such a value in drafts right now because you can get him late, not mid rounds, late rounds. Um, and that's where it's like, he's one of the last starters left. So Cam helps me believe in that. And, and I also believe in Cam Newton. I think he's going to be pretty good for fantasy. He has never not been good for fantasy when he's on the field. Do you agree with the assessment of Sony Michelle, Mike? I find myself while he is a great value late in drafts, perceptually, I just, I just don't know if we're gonna get it <laughs> when we need it. E yeah, that's very fair. But I'm, I'm fine with his draft price because he's just building in, building in the margin for Sony Michelle to hit some type of a ceiling at running back 37 right now in best ball. Like that's, that's absolutely outstanding value. Now his counterpoint or counterpart, I should say, of James White, who has averaged 94 targets over the last four years. How do you guys feel about James White as you know, just a later round PPR running back who's had great fantasy success, has also been kind of meh, and the we saw enough of, of the uh, Cam Newton doesn't throw to the running back narrative. Like Christian McCaffrey blew that up. So if James White is there... In a, in a Patriots system, and Cam Newton's the quarterback, he, White's still going to see targets. But do you do you want James White on any teams? I I don't think I've even considered drafting James White at I any point of this offseason. I think a lot of it, to me, has to do with whether Nikhil Harry is a viable target in this offense on a regular basis, and whether this absolute atrocious trade for Mohamed Sanu ends up being 
a horrible bust or not. I mean, Mohamed Sanu in Atlanta was a slot dominator. And here you have Julian Edelman in that spot in this offense, and Sanu did nothing. If Harry, Sanu, and Edelman are the primary targets in this offense, then James White's going to be one of those players that, in a pinch, yeah, you can start him, but it's not a reliable week-to-week type of player. Um, A lot of what Cam Newton did successfully the last time we saw him healthy on the field was attributed to uh, essentially short passing game, putting him in a position where he could succeed on the underneath routes, which is complimentary for James Wright. If he lines up in the slot and runs some of those underneath high percentage throws for Cam Newton in this offense, then maybe, but I, you're right. I, it's a weird dynamic where James White doesn't really fit into the narrative fantasy wise for this team. And I don't know if that's a mistake or not. I think it's just because we can't have our, we don't have our heads around this offense. Well, you're, you're certainly going to pass the ball less with Cam Newton than you did with Tom Brady. Cam Newton's never been anywhere near the the passing volume that Brady had last year. Uh, part of that is because he scrambles from time to time, and, and those are the plays that take away from the pass-catching running back. J- you know, I'm going to say something that I think will surprise a lot of people. James White is not Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> when <laughs> when they brought in Christian McCaffrey, yes, Cam Newton threw the sure. ball to him because he's Christian McCaffrey. I don't think what? they're going to – yes, thank you. I mean, shocking. Um, but the reality is I think a lot of the dump offs, the timing routes, the, the pockets collapsing, get it to my check down guy from Brady. Those are gone with Cam Newton. Now it's scramble buy time, find something, scramble, throw the ball downfield or uh, pick it up with my legs. So, uh, he'll be involved in a PPR league. Maybe you can have, you know, a, a, a borderline flex player, but he's not a guy that I'm interested in. Julian now, I- Edelman is the. Wide receiver 33 right now in drafts. Nikhil Harry is the wide receiver 65 in drafts. Yeah, Mike, I, were you going to talk about the wideouts? I was. Like Julian Edelman, I'm still – I'm confident with Julian Edelman, especially at this draft cost of wide receiver 33 currently in best ball. He's coming off the best year of his career. Like Julian Edelman, he's, he, he's already an outlier in terms of age and production. So I'm still – willing to draft you know the the wide receiver 10 and half ppr i'm willing to give him a shot in the wide receiver 30s what i wanted to bring up i took a deeper look at Nikhil harry and comparable drafted players so i went and i looked because harry was a bust and what kind of hope should we have for a player of his draft pedigree to break out so over the last 10 years I looked at first and re- first and second round wide receivers who were drafted who put up under 30 receptions in their rookie season. We have 27 wide receivers who have next year data. So across these players, again, these I, I know 30 is kind of an arbitrary number, but I wanted like a really low number to see if these players succeeded or not. Of the 27 players, the average receptions for their rookie season, 16 receptions. The average increase... To the next year, about 16 receptions. So really not anything that you were Is happy that, with. Can I ask you a question for clarity sure. there, though? Because, I mean, Nikhil Harry didn't see a snap till week 11. Does that include players that are this is, this is, injured? It doesn't even I matter? Didn't re- I did not remove players for any reason. Of uh, like Some guys were hurt. Some guys just didn't produce. He was a little bit of both because he was hurt for the, the majority of the season, but then really didn't come in. Correct. And and splash at all. There 12, were what, three, 12 receptions on the entire year, something yeah, like yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. There were three players who made a big jump that you were happy with. That would have been Randall Cobb, who went up 55 receptions. He went up 55. <laughs> re- <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh, nice. hey, just give me, hey, we're remote today, Mike. Give me a second. Uh, DJ Chark went up 59 receptions, and Alshon Jeffrey went up 65 receptions. Now, there are some notable players in this group that took a few years to kind of become something like Golden Tate, Demarius Thomas, Devontae Parker. Parker. <laughs> Devontae Parker is in that group now. And and Mike Williams, I kind of put him in that bunch of he's he like he's he's a fine fantasy player now, but if you're just going on historical comps, it's it's not it's not positive news for Nikhil Harry. Yeah, my my initial thought was the same as Andy's was that he missed so much of the season due to injury that you, you can't really tell. It's just but, hard you know, to hold twelve receptions against a guy that didn't play till week eleven. Yeah, I mean that, but that is the thing, right? He he still played in seven games, and you know would have his sixteen game pace in those seven was twenty seven receptions. So that uh, that's not good. 
Um, yeah, they're just. I I will apologize for him. I he I have no qualms with taking a shot at him. I think he's got equal odds of being the number one wide receiver on that team, and you're paying nothing for him. He did have more rushing attempts uh, than their third round running back selection, who was not <laughs> injured the whole season, in Damian Harris. So that's incredible. Is that true? That's that is that's true. a funny stat. Yeah, I I like a shot on one of these players. If you look at the team as a whole, as we move on to um, to Buffalo. I feel like every single player on this entire team has been adjusted down in ADP due to the ambiguity of this offseason and losing Tom Brady. There is a, you know, if, if there's a proportionate Brady bump in the on the Tampa side, there is a what's yeah, the opposite of a what's the opposite of a bump? How do you go a dip? down? A dip? Yeah, a dip, yeah, yeah. There, there's a Brady dip in all ADPs on this team. So whether it's Sony Michelle, James White, Nikhil Harry, Julian Edelman, if you have a beat on this team, if you have a player you like. You're getting him cheaper than they'll finish. And the ironic part is we could very easily look back and say that Cam this coming year was better than Brady was last year and that Brady this coming year was worse for fantasy purposes than Jameis Winston was last year. It, it may, it's possible that you should be getting a Brady dip in Tampa. Sure. And yeah. and, and it's, it's a gross question, but I want to throw it out. If you have to, if you're in a really deep league and you got to grab one of these tight ends of Matt Lacoste, who was on the team last year, did nothing, and then you have the rookies Devin Aziazi, Oi Oi Oi, or Dalton Keene, who are you picking? You have yeah. to take one. Don't tell me you've not taken one. You have to. Gross. I said I it was take, gross. Okay, my answer, if I'm on the clock and I have to take one, is Jordan Reed, and I'm not joking. <laughs> I would rather have Jordan Reed on my roster right now, hoping he gets signed somewhere than one of those guys. Yeah, I guess it's Ozzy Ozzy, but he's a rookie tight end with under 800 collegiate receiving yards in his career. So, ew. And Thanks, let's be Mike. honest. Thanks uh, for the gross question, Mike. Uh, you're welcome. And let's be honest. Ahead of Jordan Reed would obviously be Dan Arnold, the postman of course, yes. who will well, dominate. Why, why are you bringing up Dan Arda? We're trying to talk about the Patriots. We're talking tight ends that don't matter. <laughs> How dare you say the postman doesn't matter? Just statistically, Mike, not in actuality. Thank you. Not in your life. All right. Before we get on to the Buffalo Bills, I want to thank today's sponsor, Omaha Steaks. Look, Omaha. Omaha has been making me into a master chef. Uh, I am a chef. If you did not know that, I am now a chef thanks to Omaha Steaks. They're offering their steakhouse grilling packages with an exclusive offer for the Foot Clan, the Grand Summer Grill Out Package. It, it lets you stay at home and eat like you're at the best steakhouse in town. Or in my case, if you are at home, you are at the best steakhouse in town. We're talking Omaha Steaks, bacon wrap, filet mignon, pork chops, chicken, kielbasa, and more. It is awesome. It is so much steak you, you you are going to love this. Not only that, but you're going to get four burgers, four gum, uh, gourmet jumbo franks free with your order. Mm, it mm. is awesome. Visit omahasteaks.com and type footballers in the search bar to shop the summer grill packs today. And don't forget, when you order the grand summer grill out package, you're also going to receive four jumbo franks and four Omaha Steaks burgers Free to complete your steakhouse experience. Visit omahasteaks.com. Type footballers in the search bar. All right, let's talk about the Buffalo Bills. Last year, they went 10 and 6. Big additions this offseason Stephon Diggs, third round rookie running back Zach Moss. Um, they lost Frank Gore, although Gore did not retire. Don't be silly. Of course. Not. And, um, you know, Josh Allen last year made some strides. This team was, you know, we talk a lot about it wanting to have an identity in terms of running the football, um, which I think is important for Josh Allen to have success at the NFL level. You need to be able to run the ball because he was a very successful play action quarterback. He was not a successful quarterback outside of the play action, but they didn't run the ball disproportionately last year. They were willing to put the ball in Josh Allen's hands. Uh, especially over the back half of the season. And I think that there are a lot of high fantasy expectations for this team this year. A lot of players that are just likable in terms of, you know, Josh Allen being that uh, later round quarterback that we all think could 
you know, win win you a week because of his rushing prowess or even end up top five on the year. Uh, Devin Singletary is interesting. There are question marks around his role in the offense. And then Stephon Diggs. Um, Diggs is so difficult. Uh, I found this out last year. He was the uh, fourth player since 1992 to have 1,100 yards on fewer than 100 targets. Yes, he's, and, he's very good. I he's mean, very good. it's ridiculous. And honestly, I could see that exact recipe working for Stephon Diggs in this offense again this year where, no, the targets aren't what a number one wide receiver demands, wants, should receive, the kind of things that makes made Stephon Diggs unhappy in Minnesota, and yet the production could still end up there in terms of total yardage. Uh, he's being drafted at the wide receiver 26 right now. I think I'm just comfortable with him right there. Yeah, I, I think he's a value there. Um, it, we've talked about this early in the offseason a lot. I was much higher on Diggs than you two were. But when push came to shove, I didn't see him as a top 15 wide receiver. Uh, but I do see him as a wide receiver, too. I think he gets north of 125 targets when I look at how this team's going to break it up and, and how they're going to play. Their pace of play at the end of last season picked up dramatically. A lot the, of no huddle. A lot of no huddle. All of a sudden, they weren't this low-volume team. They were a high-volume team. And I think, look, getting Stephon Diggs only helps that. You've got personnel to stay out there on the field with three really good wide receivers and just keep the defense without being able to substitute march down the field. I'm I'm really excited for what this offense could do and I do think Diggs will be efficient uh and have enough volume to be a a, a locked and loaded wide receiver too for me. So at 26, I think it's a slight value, not a huge value. And when it comes to Josh Allen, look, he's not the best real life quarterback but he is a very good fantasy quarterback. The the and but it's going to be a tale of two halves. I worry because you start the season. I like drafting him. The Jets, the Dolphins, the Rams, the Raiders. Uh, you know, it's not the it's not the worst schedule there. But on the course of the season, the Bills played the eighth easiest schedule of pass defenses last year, and they played the eighth toughest in twenty twenty. No offense faces tougher increase in caliber of pass defenses. Mm. According to Warren Sharp, who that's the one that I, I trust when it comes to actually looking at strength of schedule because it's not it goes much, much deeper. It includes free agency and, and things like that. So on the course of the season, Josh Allen is he's either going to take a major step forward as an NFL passer or is he's gonna be in for some trouble. Mike, did you want to contribute any thoughts on the Stefan Diggs discussion? Uh, all, all my Stefan Diggs comments are always related to Josh Allen's inaccuracy going down the field. He could throw the ball very, very far. Just we've not seen it be accurate. Last year uh, on, on deep passes, he was the 29th uh, rated quarterback, which is one spot ahead of Mitchell Trubisky. It's also two spots behind David Blau. So... David Blau more accurate going down the field than Josh Allen. That that's because when David Blau went down the field, Kenny Galladay was reaching up these, and grabbing these things. These and now are Stephon adjusted. Diggs. This is no. these are adjusted completion percentages. So it it tosses out like if it's if the receiver dropped the ball, that gets knocked out of this. One of the problems that Devin Singletary may face as the running back here in Buffalo is the same situation we have with Sonny Michelle, where vulturing goal line opportunities. Very easy to have happen to you with Cam Newton, with Josh Allen. Last year, well, Devin Singletary. may not even get him. Yeah, that's it. Like, I mean, he, he didn't get he, him last year. He didn't yeah, get him. Yeah, he may not be on the field to get them. Last year, Devin Singletary had three carries inside of the 10, and they all came in one game. Now, he scored. <laughs> like I don't know why they decided to go away from him. Meanwhile, Frank Gore, last year, 18 carries inside the 10 and produced two rushing touchdowns from there. Uh, on, on those those carries, but they just kept going to Frank Gore. So I think that's that will be a problem for Devin Singletary and his ceiling because Zach Moss, he can play that role. It, a lot is being said of the Bills want Zach Moss to play the Frank Gore role, and the way I read into that more is that Zach Moss will be the goal line running back. Singletary is – He's one of those players that might be really annoying to own. He's going to be like Philip Lindsay. Yeah, there's there's a category of players where they're on the field and it's like first and ten from the eighteen, and you know if Singletary doesn't score, 
on this next run, he may be off the field. And unfortunately, that is just, you know, for he's a fourth round pick right now. He's RB23. They say they want to involve him in the passing game more, but that can be a really annoying fantasy player. Yeah. I, look, if they gave him the opportunities, he would score. I remember scouting him in college and I, 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 I wrote down that I think he would be an awesome goal line back, which is so weird because he's a tiny, undersized, 200 pound guy. But I, I, I was, I wrote down, man, I'm going to draft him super high if he goes to the Saints or the Patriots, a team that will see that and utilize him there. I, I think if he gets the opportunity, he'll crush. So there is upside there. Sure. But I think all three of us project him to not get the opportunity. And so if you're not really a pass catching back and you're not getting goal line, it doesn't matter how good you are. He's going to be great between the 20s and at the end of the day, going to disappoint your fantasy roster unless they give him the goal line he deserves. And I don't think Zach Moss is good enough to well, have that role. And if you're in on Zach Moss, just so you have uh, context, games with Devin Singletary, Frank Gore averaged about 11 opportunities per game. So if you're if he is in that role, like that's maybe if you throw in the goal line that maybe Zach Moss has value, but I think he's going to be a running back that if you don't get a touchdown, you got a really bad fantasy day. The tough part about Buffalo is I think they're going to be a really good team. I think sure. they're a, a top 10 NFL team and here you have their number, you know, the highest running back in fantasy drafts going at RB23. And so there is, to Jason's point, there is upside if things go the right way. If they do involve Singletary in the passing game more, if he gets to split those goal line opportunities with the Zach Moss to keep defenses on their toes, that would be, you know, you're going to have a guy that finishes above RB23, but there's just more risk. I like running backs on great teams. I like running backs on teams that are going to move the football. Now, are we... New Jersey, My or I'm sorry, New York, Miami, the Rams, and Las Vegas to start the year as well. Yeah. Are we overlooking John Brown, who was the number one wide receiver on this team last year, was pretty solid for fantasy football. I know that Stephon Diggs is there, but in the range of outcomes, like, do you see no positive signs for John Brown? Jay, you, you, Stephon Diggs is there and has eliminated him? Yeah, best ball. Best ball, sure. He'll, he'll catch a deep pass, take it to a touchdown. That's fine. But I, I, the volume is going to shift over to Diggs. You, you, you didn't trade the world, pay the man uh, as much as you did. He's been working with Josh Allen already. I mean, it, this is Diggs. Dig will have a target market share of the team that renders the other guys pretty much useless if you are trying to predict which weeks to start them. I mean, Cole Beasley and John Brown, they'll be on the field. They'll get receptions. They'll have some touchdowns. So there'll be a couple games that are fine, but you're not going to be able to start them on a regular basis. There was only four games last year that John Brown ended up inside the top 24, and that was without Stephon Diggs. Beasley sure. demands a lot of targets. Um, I don't think it'll be easy. He's a player that you could roll out there and hope. That's uh, no question about that, but I think yeah, he is a talented. complimentary type of wide receiver. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the New York Jets. Somehow shocking to me. I know that we watch football, but it was still a surprise to see them mm -hmm. at 7-9. and nine. Couldn't believe it myself. I mean, they came off, a, I believe, a 4-12 and 12 year with Have Todd Bowles. Wait, what? The Jets were 7-9? and nine? This is yes. what I'm saying. There is a no. certain there's a certain stake. No. I know. I know they really were, Mike. I'm quadruple checking this. You can quadruple yeah, check it. Please do, because all three of us we saw this. In your mind, no way Mike, the Jets won seven. The Jets are 0 and 16, I believe. No, no, no. Like, I don't no, think they were that. Three but and thirteen. They were seven and nine. They were seven and nine. What? They had to start the season with what, Luke Falk at quarterback for three games? Was that the uh the hand that yeah. Adam Gaze was dealt? And yet, this team did not show signs statistically of being an improved offense at all. They just weaseled their way to 7-9. and nine. It's a make-or-break year for Sam Darnold. Yet, he is 23 years old, which is... <laughs> younger what? than Joe Burrow. Is he younger? I think he Joe Burrow turns 23 later this year. I believe uh -huh. that Sam Darnold is younger than Joe Burrow. I will fact-check myself. Oh, Joe Burrow is 23 right now. Yeah. D December 10th. So, yeah, it, regardless, the point is yeah, we Darnold need... just turned 23. There you go. So he is younger. And uh, so Darnold is in a position where we knew that coming out, how young he was. Hasn't been great, but this is a player that last year was under pressure. 42% of the time he was dropping back, and he had Jamison Crowder to throw the football to. Chris Herndon wasn't there. Not a lot of options. Robbie Anderson up and down. 
these are my excuses his, for what's his, transpired he was for seven Sam and Darnold. Six man, he was above I know. 500 with that I know. team. With and that offensive amazing. line, thirty first in rushing <laughs> yards per game, thirty uh, first in rushing touchdowns, 29th in passing yards per game, twenty seventh in passing touchdowns. Their defense was pretty good. I've I have I have wrongly uh, when I've been looking at other players and saying. Um, you know, oh, they've got this team, this team, and the Jets out there that they're playing. The Jets' defense was was pretty legit. Um, so I I think they deserve a lot of the credit. And the offensive line changes this year. I mean, that could change everything for this team if they replace their head coach. Well, I, I was gonna say it could also change nothing. I mean, these are still you. You've made a couple of strides on O line, but we haven't seen it carried out. And you're in a tough division, and you are you were a really, really bad offense last year. And if we're talking about adding Denzel Mims as the solution for your offense, while you lose Robbie Anderson, or Brashad, Brashad, Perriman. Brashad, That's Perriman. Brashad Perriman, yeah. I mean, and Frank Gore. Brashad Perriman and Frank Gore have been added to save an offense that finished, you know, basically dead last in a ton of offensive Dude, metrics. So this... this like, I, we've seen enough of, of Adam Gaze that he has earned his nickname. But if we seriously see Frank Gore, who I love, I love Frank Gore, but last year, Frank Gore over the second half of the year was 2.6 a carry in 80 attempts. If we seriously see Frank Gore displacing Le'Veon Bell on the field, that like to me, that will be a new, a new low for Adam Gaze. Unfortunately, any fantasy football bet on a New York Jet involves the variable of Adam Gaze's uh, stupidity, historical stupidity. This is, look. I love your choice of adjectives there. I mean. Because it, <laughs> it, that's all it is. I wanted to say idiocy. I will fully accept stupidity. What a dumb dumb. <laughs> Just as a coach. Just well, sure, sure. There's not a lot of con- statistical reasons to counterpoint that. Dumb dumb is not necessarily the same level of adjective that I used, but it it's still appropriate from like projecting these players. I mean, I believe Jameson Crowder was their leading receiver in both in re- yards, receptions, and touchdowns. You know, I like Chris Herndon a lot. I'm taking him late in drafts. We took him in Scotty Fish. I think he will be a player that, you know, maybe of all of the offensive pass catchers on this team, offers the fantasy owner the best actual, you know. Value return, yeah. I, I like, I like Denzel Mims, but a second round pick, okay. Uh, I'm well, look, man. Jameson what's going to happen? Crowder is it's a boring pick. I get it. It's not a ceiling pick at all. But 122 targets, 830 yards, six touchdowns. He's not a top 24 wide receiver for your squad, but you're not drafting him as no. that. He's he is a very he doesn't have the ceiling, but I think that his floor is very sturdy. And he can be a foundational, like wide PPR wide receiver three for your team. I would I would put Denzel Mims into the last pick of the draft category, though, hmm. for fantasy owners because he could start from day one. And if you have that guy, we always say like at the very end of drafts, take a player that you might get to find out something in week one. I think Mims is in that category of like remember when Marcus Colston was drafted at the back of a drafts and game one in the NFL he comes out and explodes. In his rookie like season, Terry Mi- McLaurin. That's he was a sure. guy we talked about as a as a last pick or even after your drafts. Like you should grab Terry McLaurin just in case. Now, be- interestingly enough, would you put Brashad Perryman there as a last pick in the draft? I mean, because you're you're making that bet, right? Is it Denzel Mims or is it Brashad Perryman who, who starts in that role? You you can do that, but you're talking about Perryman on his fourth NFL team, I believe, and like ceiling wise, I would just rather take the chance on the guy that was number one in college football and contested catches, second round draft pick, meant to be the future of the franchise. If you want to go Perryman then though, Jay, that would Perryman let me was get, very good at the end of the year with Jameis. Yeah. It's just do you are they building the offense around him? Maybe. I mean I it's Jameson Crowder his floor and his ceiling are identical. Yes. Jameson Crowder sure. is it it's not there's no room to move. It's just right there. Yeah, and uh, I just talked about Le'Veon Bell on the bounce back show. His price tag for a a running back that is going to get that volume and the targets. Like uh, I'm, I'm back in on Le'Veon Bell. I don't think he's going to jump all the way back to being a top eight 
like a superstar, but he's going to be real solid. The problem with Lev Bell is again what we brought up with the variables of Adam Gaze. Like you, I said, he could it be, will the, be a like, new low. Like the uh, you know, he looks like he's the delicious uh, like potato salad out on the table, and then there's a fly in it, and you didn't know it, and you, it just looks like the greatest thing. And Adam Gaze, he he filled it with flies, and uh, it, it doesn't work there's, out. There's Frank Gore gets the no first potatoes carry. at all. It's the just thing is, flies. is Gaze doesn't like Lev Bell. <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't. He didn't want and him on the team. he loves Frank Gore, and yeah, that scares the crap out of me. But you're right. Value-wise, if things go according to plan, Lev Bell is such a better runner, please let Saner heads prevail here. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I would I would still go with the, uh, the Melvin Gordon David Johnson of that kind of, you know, ex-great running back group over <laughs> Lev Bell. But uh, he he is he is a value where he's being drafted. Any other Jets related uh, topics you guys want to get into I, before we move on? I think fantasy we've, wise, we've Darnold. That. The only the only question is, you know, is Darnold a guy who could who could break out? I mean, he was mm, no. sick. He's young. You don't believe so? <laughs> I, I do don't. not. No, I don't believe that they have made enough. I, they've equipped him with enough weapons to make. See, me. I think it's possible. I think I like, he he doesn't have. Like on paper, it doesn't look like elite, elite skill players around him. But Le'Veon Bell is still very a very capable guy. Crowder, safe uh, reception guy, and then the upside of Mims plus Rashard Perryman. Well, I mean, it's it's a budget version of of a high flying offense. But I can I can see what Jace is talking about. Yeah, Why, is no, Jason no, no, actually no. saying not talk- that because nope. I didn't hear oh, him say that. Okay, well, I'm, then I'm I will ask- I will be the one who says it. I can I- see it. I'm not betting on it. Yeah, I'm just it. asking the question. And at the end of all of this, all jokes aside, because we love to joke about Adam Gase. He's the b-hole. He, he, but at the end of the day, all of the questionable options on this team are going to be relying upon Adam Gase doing a good job if they want to break out in fantasy. So I'm not going to take the shot on Darnold. I'm I not going to take the shot on Mims or Perriman. And I'm not going to take the shot on Herndon as my single late round i mean you know in, in scotty fish where you're drafting a bunch of tight ends and you're going 22 rounds sure um i'm not gonna bet on these jets that's my final answer I, it definitely came through not betting on the jets drew lock or sam darnold for that opportunity jimmy g or sam darnold i mean i, I would definitely go jimmy g over sam darnold teddy bridgewater or sam darnold when yeah, it go teddy comes down to it yeah yeah for those reasons i'm out Shark Tank. <laughs> Shark Tank. <laughs> Miami Dolphins, 5-11 and 11 last year. I believe they ended the year at 5-4 and four over the <laughs> last nine games. They, really a big turnaround? They tried to not be able to draft Tua. That, they tried their best. Yeah, they did. <laughs> it they was still incredible. got him. Uh, remember Flores, the game with, with the Bengals where it was like basically this is – the winner of this, For the number the, one pick, yeah. The loser of this game gets the number one pick, and the the Dolphins had to like come all the way back. The game went into overtime, <laughs> and it's like, why? Why are you doing this? I think yeah. it worked out. They have added so it, many yes. pieces, and I we we need to be careful as fantasy players to not view the Miami Dolphins defense as a, a great matchup as a plus matchup i don't think it is necessarily well well we i mean so many teams you don't really know until the season's going but they went from a super young inexperienced and poor talent uh off defense to a really high caliber tons of great players all over the place um they spent they can, 237 million dollars in free agency that's insane. And they had so many picks. That was, and I, I thought they had a great draft. That was $100 million more than the, the next highest free agent spending, which was the Lions. This is not the team and defense that they had last year. That doesn't mean that that will congeal into a great division-challenging defense in, week, in year one. But it, it, Jason's point is probably the most fantasy-relevant one you can make. Don't view the Dolphins' defense as a matchup in the same way that you might have looked at them last year when they finished 27th against the run, 26th against the pass in terms of yards given up to both. It might not be that way this year. What Byron Jones, mm-hmm. um, some big pieces, what Shaq Lawson from Buffalo, uh, Vinoy from New England, 
So they're just sniping people out of their division on top of that. And so very interesting this year. A lot of people like Brian Flores. I think he's a pretty good head coach. Chan Gailey is taking over at offensive coordinator this year. That's where things get very interesting for me with Chan Gailey. One, I mean, you got it's the reunion, so that's that's always just fun. Of Chan Gailey is back with Ryan Fitzpatrick, and just taking a look back at the history of Chan Gailey with with Ryan Fitzpatrick because you got three years in Buffalo where he was the head coach. You got two years in uh, it, at the, with the Jets where Chan Gailey was the OC. And you have like big time fantasy producers, and you see some tendencies of uh, like in Buffalo. You guys remember Stevie Johnson? Remember how good that dude was? Stevie, yeah, Stevie man. Johnson what a was awesome. weird route but runner, right? In those three years, Stevie Johnson with Fitzpatrick averaged 141 targets. The two years in New York with Fitzpatrick, Brandon Marshall averaged 150 targets. Last year, Devontae Parker did what he did. On 128, so it's like there is room for growth for Devontae Parker, and then you have the running backs, like the Buffalo and the Jets days. There was always a running back over 50 targets. The running back position as a whole was always seeing over 100 targets. Like there's you no know Jordan Howard's not getting that. I I know. I, so well, where's Jordan, where is that opportunity target wise then in the Miami yes, backfield? I, and I don't know. And honestly, it's funny as Jordan Howard. His rookie year saw fifty targets. He he has plummeted since. That was then. the learning. That was the learning process yes. for the Jordan Matt, Howard targets. And Matt Breida has never seen more than thirty six targets in a year. But I'm my point is, we have years of evidence of tendencies of play calling from Chan Gailey, and there is fantasy goodness to be had from it this is. Team. It I think the biggest question that if we could answer with a hundred percent clarity. Um, changes everything that changes everything, which is who's going to be the starting yeah. quarterback and for how many weeks uh, I, everybody. I mean, it's definitely going to be Ryan Fitzpatrick to start the season with the shortened uh, off season and all that. They're, they're going to let to have a little bit more time. I would be shocked if week one he is, but I'm starting to think more and more that Tua could end up taking a, a uh, red shirt season. Because if the defense is actually good enough and the Dolphins can win some games, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick, when he came in, you know, remember, it started with Josh Rosen and then uh, he came in in relief. They had a week five bye and then he basically was the starter from week six on. Um, do you do you guys know? I mean, this is fantasy and they had a terrible defense, so it won't be the same. But do you know where Ryan Fitzpatrick was from week six on for fantasy? I don't. I'm very excited to hear, though. <laughs> He's the quarterback, too, behind Lamar Jackson. No. <laughs> what? From I week mean, six on? Yeah, he was. No. He, he was just gunslinging Nonsense. and just, I, throw, you know, obviously I, for I'm going to throw the wet blanket on this quickly. Okay. Uh, if this offensive line doesn't improve, two is taking over due to injury before he'll take over due to skill. You can't That's injure the, Fitz, Fitz You magic. certainly can injure Fitz Magic. He's been hurt before, and he can get hurt again. That that is the other reality of the situation is that Tua might not just take over because of a struggling record. He may Holy take over because he has crap. to. That's <laughs> right. the real number, it's, Mike. Number that two. Is, that is the real number because like he he was either awesome or he was in the twenties, which was pretty rough. So, ooh, Jason, like go, we've like, been go here from, before, like, guys. We've seen this movie. Seven on. Yeah, right, yeah. And you know what that movie was? Ryan Fitzpatrick yes. on the Jets with Chan Gailey oh, surrounded. One good year, one bad year. Sure. If, and that, yeah, that's that, all I'm saying is you do have – you have Ryan Fitzpatrick, how many teams has he played for? I believe it's 28. Oh. He's, 20, that he's a, coming, that is he's a coming lot. for Josh McCown. Uh, I'll, I'm just throwing the wet blanket on that every time you expect something from Ryan Fitzpatrick in his entire career, that is every time fair. he lets you down. That yeah. is fair. He's, so, no, he's I, a good at surprising. He's not good at delivering on a promise. Right. I, I would agree. And, and you know, the thing is, and this is where I was saying this question affects the rest of the Dolphins. When I look at Devontae Parker, I would be excited about him with Ryan Fitzpatrick. I right, know that right. he will throw it whether he's open or not and give him the chance to make that contested catch. 
I don't know that with Tua. I would be excited for Preston Williams, who was actually, you know, leading the team as an undrafted rookie before he got injured. I would be excited about Gasicki, who was a top tight end over the final part of the year. But as soon as Tua makes that switch over, I'm I feel like I'm out across the board on these options for rookie year Tua. So in the beginning of the season, um, maybe you'll feel good about your draft picks if you go after some of these Dolphins, but I worry about the longevity and the beginning of the season is at New England and then Buffalo. So, ooh, I mean, you, and then they play about Seattle in week four I, I, at New England where Ryan Fitzpatrick was yes. quarterback number four to finish up the year. Yeah. And Devontae uh, Parker torched, uh, who is it? Gilmore. I, I yes, mean, or yeah. perhaps you were talking about week seven when at Buffalo, Ryan Fitzpatrick was the number seven fantasy quarterback on the week. Yeah, this but their is, defense was amazing. terrible. And so this they had to amazing. they had to sling it around. I know it was the Dolphins were a lot of fun last year for fantasy this season. You are taking a very dangerous me, approach to draft these pass catchers. Let, let me illustrate something that took place just so that Mike doesn't move him to number one right now. Uh, Fitzpatrick, remember the year, remember before the the Jameis year when he started the year and was just absolutely on fire. The Tampa number, Bay year? The Tampa Bay year. He was number sure. one in week one, number six in week two, number four in week three. So he's more than capable of that. Mm. When he came back and took over the job in week eight through 11, it was 14, 5, 19, 21. Dang it, that's still not that bad. There was a tough <laughs> right. there. Let's <laughs> go. Right. Right. Oh, he's number okay. one. Fitzpatrick <laughs> season. Uh, I, I will say this, Jason. I think it's a little bit difficult to say that every player is going to take a nosedive if they determine that Tua should take over. Because we're sitting here, we've, we've talked about the Bengals already on divisional breakdowns. We've talked about what, that, what Joe Burrow could provide. Rookie quarterbacks do a little bit more than they've done in the past nowadays. If Tua is capable of taking over, he's a very accurate quarterback. He is a very uh, capable quarterback. He's the number five pick in the draft that was projected to be the number one. So but having burrow like expectations with with Tua if he's healthy is I, I, not unreasonable. I mean, he's no, a passer first, and many yes. would believe he's a better passer than Joe Burrow. I I agree that it, it look he's still going to you know Terry McLaurin was fine last year even with Dwayne Haskins. So players can overcome that. But I think the difference here is the illustration between last year having. Andy Dalton in his worst season ever, uh, that is when he wasn't benched, um, going to Joe Burrow versus we had a very good Fitzpatrick right. stretch going to Tua. So one is going up, one is going down for these weapons. And all of the projections when we're looking at, uh, you know, when we're looking at Devontae Parker's breakout and Gasicki's second half of the year breakout, all of those things required that Fitzpatrick, you know, gunslinger mentality. So I, you know, I'm not, I'm not crazy about any of these options, but I do think if I had, if like, if I'm taking a quarterback in a three quarterback league, right, you're or a two quarterback, you're playing a super flex and I'm grabbing my third. I think almost everybody will draft Tua ahead of Fitzmagic, uh, assuming that he'll get the start at some point. I would actually draft Ryan Fitzpatrick first in the hopes that he gets to continue playing at the level he played last year while Tua learns. Running back shot. Are you taking it on Jordan Howard or are you taking it on Matt Breida? If I have to have one, I would go Howard. I, I find myself less and less inclined. You know, we've talked about he's basically the last starting running back in the in ADP. But then when I get there, I'm like, I don't want that. The thing I like <laughs> about taking Howard over Breida is if you look historically at Kyle Shanahan's success with the plug and play running back after running back after running back after running. I mean, this was a guy that Kyle Shanahan turned Ryan Terrain into a great player. Okay. Mm -hmm. Brita's leaving that plug and play system. And most players that leave it don't succeed. Jordan Howard's already left Chicago to succeed in Philadelphia, at least kind of from a, you know, team switching standpoint, we've seen it with Jordan Howard. That's why I lean that direction. Do we finally get Jordan Howard with 40 receptions because of Jan Gailey? On 365 targets. <laughs> I would I would take Howard as well. Yeah, I think that the Jordan Howard or Sony Michelle late in drafts. Mm. I would go Sony. Uh, yeah, probably Sony, but I don't. Yeah, I don't know how the backfield's going to break down between Howard and Brita. There's some talk about Brita extension, and then they decided to delay it in Miami. So that could change my 
view of the situation. But right now, I've, I I kind of like Howard. So tough schedule to start the year, though. I mean, yeah, Jordan Howard gets to go to New England and then face Buffalo and then face Jacksonville and Seattle. So Jacksonville's nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one <laughs> in Jacksonville, though. All right. Uh, any other thoughts on the Dolphins? I think it's going to be um, a better year for them, but that might equate to six and ten in this division. Who do you have win in this division? Let's close it out with Patriots. That. I have the Patriots winning. I really want to go Buffalo, but I, I'll take I, Buffalo. I think with Cam, the Patriots will win, but Buffalo is right there with them. I think there's two really good teams in this division and two not so really good teams in this division. And I think we should actually go back because we didn't really talk about Mike Kosicki very much, who is a yes, sure. It's, he's an athletic monster. He's one of uh, mine and Andy's favorite later round guys to really break out. Jason, I can't remember I'm, where you I'm are there, on him. I'm there with you. I just worry about the, the quarterback. Okay. And the, yeah, he had he a lot of better numbers. The, Sorry, go ahead, Mike. He's He lines up in the slot, and like he fits – so many of the of the check boxes that you want from a later round tight end of high draft capital, uh, very very athletic, lines up in the slot like they he kind of already had a mini breakout and and people are still drafting him like that didn't happen or they're just afraid of uh, Preston Williams because mm -hmm. the, Mike Gesicki's breakout did align very uh, noticeably with when Preston Williams uh, left the year with an ACL. Yeah, from yeah. week nine on, when Preston Williams was out of the way, Mike Gesicki last year was the tight end seven. He was very good. And so um, I I do think with the lack of pass-catching running backs, I think those three options, if if Fitzmagic is the quarterback, will all be able to be good enough. I just worry about when Tua comes in. All right, that'll do it for today's show. We want to thank Pristine Auction. Here's some sweet values that some uh, listeners – Got on uh, some sports memorabilia at Pristine Auction. A Kenny Galladay signed mini helmet for $67. Very My smooth. Miles Sanders signed Eagles football for $61. Blake Jarwin, Mike, a signed Woo! jersey, $1. Oh, you know, right. Not really. It was $35, but basically free. It was not me, uh, <laughs> but I didn't realize they had Blake Jarwin gear. So Mike just bids them up for other people. He goes and bids all the Blake Jarwin gear up. Mike wins enough of his own. <laughs> yeah. Uh, PristineAuction.com. Use our code BALLERS when you sign up. You'll get a $10 credit, which would turn that Blake Jarwin jersey into a $25 jersey. Check them out at PristineAuction.com. Otherwise, that is it. We'll be back on Thursday with another division breakdown. I hope you learned something because I, we all did. Yeah, you learned that Fitzpatrick is number one. In That's all right. Moving him up. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. And Footland, don't forget about Omaha Steaks Grand Summer Grill Out Package. We're talking Omaha Steaks, bacon wrap filet mignons, plus pork chops, chicken, kielbasa, and more delivered right to your door. Visit omahasteaks.com, type footballers in the search bar to shop the summer grill packs today. And this week only, Omaha Steaks is adding four burgers and four gourmet jumbo franks free with your order.